of burning out. AT&T knew that if it were to meet the demand for increased phone service, it would have to come up with something better than the vacuum tube. And if Bell Labs could produce such a product, AT&T stood to make a fortune. In the 1930s, Bell Labs director of research, Mervyn Kelly, understood quite clearly the problems with vacuum tubes. It was Kelly, after all, who recognized that if the telephone business was going to rely on relays and on vacuum tubes, then before long its future progress would be limited by the limitations of those two devices. Kelly thought the answer lay in a strange class of materials called semiconductors, such as silicon and germanium, which could both conduct and resist the flow of electricity depending on the conditions. Perhaps they could be coaxed into doing everything vacuum tubes did only better. But World War II put Kelly's plans for a new semiconductor device on hold as the nation's laboratories turned their talents to winning the war. One of the most important technical developments of the war was radar. Radar helped the Allies see through fog and darkness, track enemy planes and ships, and shoot down buzz bombs destined for London. And radar would play a key role in the invention of the transistor. To detect radar, you needed an element that required semiconductors. It was called a crystal rectifier. And he used this tiny chip of silicon inside to convert the radar signal into something that you could see in a scope. Radar was made possible through research into silicon and germanium, work that would later be essential to the invention of the transistor. At the war's end, the mines and material that once fought Hitler and Hirohita would be mobilized again, this time to make consumer products for the returning GIs and their growing families. Well, we that were in the service were very glad to be home. Uh, there was a great expansion going on. The pressure was gone, the war was over, and we, everything was just an up curve. Everything kept going. Everyone wanted a piece of the good life. For Ma Bell, business was so good, the company found it hard to keep up. AT&T was swamped with increasing demand for phone service. If the trend continued, quipped one company executive, half the women in the U.S. would have to become switchboard operators. Mervyn Kelly realized that long-distance calls could be routed automatically if a reliable electronic switch could be found. First, he needed to assemble a team of scientists smart enough to make it happen and fast. Kelly knew that other high-tech laboratories were experimenting with semiconductors too, and he did not want to risk losing a patent. Kelly tapped one of his top young physicists, Bill Shockley, to lead the team. Shockley was born in California, the only son of a mining engineer. He loved rock climbing, practical jokes, and British sports cars, and he was deadly serious about his physics. Shockley had phenomenal physical intuition. Uh, he really had a, just a feeling for the way the physics worked in these devices. I had a colleague that said he thought Shockley could see electrons, that his physical intuition was so good. Shockley was a brilliant theorist, but lousy at building experiments. He knew he needed someone who worked well with his hands, just like Bell needed Watson. He found Walter Branton, a seasoned experimental physicist already working at Bell Labs. Raised on a farm in Washington State, the self-reliant Bratton was the epitome of American ingenuity. Walter was a very good experimental physicist. He could uh, put things together out of ceiling wax and uh, paper clips, if you wish. Shockley then hired John Bardeen, a brilliant theoretical physicist trained at Princeton University. An expert on the movement of electrons within solid materials, he understood the subtleties of semiconductors. Bardeen was the precocious second son of a medical school dean from Wisconsin. He skipped three grades and entered college at the age of 15. 
They called him Whispering John. Mardin was really a quiet, contemplative, very deep kind of person, whereas Shockley was quick. Uh, and that was initially very complimentary. He would compliment Shockley's own expertise, and more importantly, with capable John Vardine in the laboratory, Shockley would be free to work on his own. With those key players in place, Shockley filled out his team with an eclectic mix of physicists, chemists, and engineers, working to attack the problem from all sides, the kind of team that had worked so well during the war. It was an example of uh, very good teamwork, and I have had personal experience in teamwork having been a bomber pilot. And this was the nearest thing that I saw to that. We were well integrated, well focused, and had good direction. And above all, they enjoyed each other's company. There was all kinds of partying that happened, and there was a, it was not at all uncommon for a, uh, for a bunch of folks to go to lunch at Snuffy's down in, uh, in Scotch Plains for, for lunch. And, uh, and have a few beers along with the steak that was, uh, uh, was available there. Betty Sparks was Bill Shockley's secretary. Bill, of course, liked uh, tricks. He jacked up the rear end of our getaway car from our wedding party so that the real wheels just spun like mad until everybody out in the front lawn of our home was laughing and getting it back down on ground where we could buzz off to New York City. This song is called Hell's Bells Laboratory. It's a song that was written in uh, the middle 50s and, and sung at various conferences uh, at the time. Written by Ian McIntosh. We've traveled a long way to bring you this song, a brand new calypso we're sure to get wrong about the reform school to which we belong. It's the Hell's Bells Laboratory. It's the Hell's Bells and Buckets of Pond. periodic chart Bill Shockley's picture is sewn over our hearts Bodine and Branding are our sweethearts at the Hell's Bells Laboratory at the Hell's Bells and buckets of blood at the Hell's Bells Laboratory In the spring of 1945, even before the team was complete, Bill Shockley was convinced he knew how to make a semiconductor amplifier. For almost a decade, he had dreamed of being the first to invent one. He had his associates assemble a crude device based on his design and began testing it. Though Bill Shockley was sure it would work, many others thought it was impossible. At the time to do this, is crazy. It's, it's unimaginable because they're so, it's so radically different. There's nothing like this. No one has had anything ever like this. And it's strange. It's, it's got strange ideas and strange behavior and strange data. His idea was to attach a battery to a piece of semiconductor and place a metal plate just above it. Now, normally, electricity won't flow through the semiconductor. But if an electric charge is applied to the plate, Shockley reasoned, the resulting electric field should draw electrons out of the atoms, creating a path for the electricity. He called this the field effect. His experimental device was a small cylinder coated on the outside with a thin film of silicon. He positioned a small metal plate just above it. The theory looked great on paper, but it didn't work. No matter what he did, he could not increase the current flowing through the cylinder. Bill Shockley was stumped. Discouraged, Shockley asked his new employee, John Bardeen, to double check his mathematics. Like Shockley, Bardeen was schooled in the new world of quantum mechanics where the 